yeah. Uh, I guess it wouldn't be revealing too much information. I'll, I'll tell you, there's there's one question on the midterm that has to do with the uh, the history of the discovery of genetics. So I know that stuff. Um, actually, speaking of things that are not going to be on midterm number four, um, there's a section of the handout on genetics that we're going to skip. Uh, there's a part right towards the end of your packet that's called population genetics. It should be the last page or two of your handout uh, on genetics. Also, no questions on that. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to cover it in today's lecture. It's, it's an important part of genetics, but for time considerations, I'm going to delay it until a little bit later on in the semester. Sound all right? All right. Um, oh, and while I'm sitting here making announcements, um, I got, I've got this, just got, got an email from Pam Darcy, who runs the Access Program. Remember, that's the one that helps students transfer to UCSC. Uh, she says, uh, the Access Spring Lab Tour to UC Santa Cruz is coming up on Friday, uh, April 27th, which I guess is Friday of next week. Uh, so those of you who are Access members can go to this. It's from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. at UC Santa Cruz. And I, I like this. She said, you might also add that I'll have freshly baked pizza for them. And I thought, you know, that, she knows college students well. If you tell them there's going to be pizza there, they would probably go to hell. Um, <laughs> But um, anyway, uh, so if you're an Access member, and especially if you're considering going to the Summer Research Institute, uh, or if you've signed up for the Summer Research Institute, you can go there and you can hear some of the people who do uh, seminars by some of the, uh, uh, some of the researchers at UCSC uh, explaining what their, what their particular research is. Okay, well, let's see. Um, so uh, we've been working on that genetics handout. Uh, but as I said, the, the last part of it is population genetics, and for right now, I'm going to skip that. I want to jump into the next lecture topic, which is uh, genes. Um, and we covered a lot of how genes work earlier in the semester. And so you might think, well, gee, why are we going over it a second time? Well, essentially, this chapter is going to add some details that we skipped the first time through. But to make sure we're still on the same page, what I want to go do is go through the basic concepts that we learned last time, including all these topics right here, and then I'll start telling you, adding more details. All right, the first time uh, we went through, I showed you a picture like this. This is supposed to represent a eukaryotic cell. There is the uh, ribosome out there in the cytoplasm. Those are amino acids floating around in the cytoplasm near it. There's the nucleus with the chromosomes uh, there. And of course, remember the ribosome is a non-membranous organelle. It's an organelle inside the cell, but it's not made of phospholipid bilayer. It's partially made of RNA and partially made of protein. Um, and it comes in two parts, one part, part called the large subunit and one part called the small subunit. There's a little groove, a little slot uh, between them. And as a preview, that's where the messenger RNA is going to click into and slide through. Um, and there you see some amino acids floating around near the ribosome. So what do ribosomes do? Well, they are the organelle that makes proteins. Uh, they link amino acids together to construct the proteins. Now, uh, each protein that's made has what's called its primary structure, which is just the sequence of amino acids in that particular protein. And that sequence is very important because the, the sequence of amino acids is what causes the protein to fold into a particular shape. And the folding of a protein is what gives it its function because that's what the, uh, the active site forms out of. Uh, so the, the ribosome needs very specific directions on which amino acids to link together in which sequence to make a particular protein. Uh, and so what I want to do is look at the gene for this particular protein which is you know, a ridiculously short protein at only three amino acids. Normally, they're about 400 amino acids. But just for the sake of simplicity, let's look at the gene for that particular protein. And of course, the genes are here in the nucleus. They are part of the chromosomes. Uh, there you see the chromosomes. There's the centromere. Each chromosome is really one long piece of 
double-stranded, double-helix DNA, and the, each gene is a segment of one chromosome. There's a gene on that chromosome. Here's another gene a little bit further down its piece of DNA. There's another gene there, another gene there. Each chromosome actually holds hundreds, or in some cases, thousands of different genes. Like that. All right, now let's zoom in on it and find that one particular gene for that one particular protein uh, that we were looking at. There it is. And we can also look at it this way, where you can see that it's actually two complementary strands. If one strand of DNA has T, the other one has to have A. If one has G, the other one has to have C. If you remember all that. And if you can imagine untwisting the DNA so it didn't look like a helix, this is the way it would look. And even though this is not a realistic way to look at the DNA, it's a little bit more pleasing to the eye because you can see the, the two complementary strands. And maybe before I go any further, I should uh, quickly mention the polarity of the strands. Uh, a strand of DNA or even a strand of RNA has a polarity, meaning that one end is not the same as the other end. And there's always one end called the five prime end, and there's always another end called the three prime end. And any nucleic acid strand, whether it's DNA or RNA, always be, gets constructed from the five prime end towards the three prime end. So if you were making a strand, you'd start here and then add nucleotides, add nucleotides, add nucleotides, add nucleotides, add nucleotides, like that. They always grow from the five prime end to the three prime end. Uh, but when you have double-stranded things, like double-stranded DNA, the two strands are anti-parallel, meaning that one is always running in that direction, so to speak, and the other one's always running in that direction, uh, from five prime to three prime, so to speak. Anyway, so think of, that's the way to think of these two strands right here. They are uh, anti-parallel. All right, and uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, the function of the genes is that they encode the proteins. They're the recipe book for all the proteins. And they use something called the genetic code, which is shown here. Uh, of course, they usually write the genetic code in RNA codons, but just imagine every U was a T, and then you'll see the, the codons in the DNA. So in this particular gene, there's a codon, ATG, and that's the first codon, and that encodes the amino acid methionine. So that's where the instruction is to begin this particular protein with the amino acid methionine. The next codon is GAA, Right there. Oops, stop, go back. Infernal machine. There we go. Next codon is GAA, right here, which is the amino acid uh, uh, glutamate. So that is going to eventually tell the ribosome amino acid number two must be glutamate. Codon number three is CCC, which you look at the chart there encodes the amino acid proline. So that's how the ribosome is going to figure out that the next amino acid in the protein is proline. And the last codon, TGA, is what's called a stop codon. Uh, here it is, uh, which is eventually going to tell the ribosome, if you're done with the protein, stop adding amino acids to it. So that's how that Protein, proteins encoded in the DNA. And uh, as a drill, well, let's just do a couple of them. Here's a protein. Uh, here's the first codon right there. What amino acid is that? That one, right? Three amine. And so if you were a ribosome, you, you would say, okay, I must begin this protein with the amino acid three amine. What's the next codon in code? <coughs> lysine, yeah. Next codon is AAA, so lysine. What is the next codon in code? AUG. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. No, I guess that's right. AUG, which would be methionine. Good. And then. <coughs> 
or AUC, no, what is AUC? Uh, isoleucine. Oh, you know, I started on the wrong one. Nope. I think I should have started there. It's important to have the right reading frame. So I think I got off on the wrong track. Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, huh. Where did I go wrong here? ACA. Threatening. AAA. Lysine. Oh, there it is. Okay, T TCG should be my next codon, which would be UCG. Serine, got it. Okay, and then the, the TGA, which would be UGA, is a stop codon there. Okay, so this particular gene would encode that protein. And uh, remember, one of the amazing things is this genetic code that relates the codons in the gene to amino acids is universal throughout all life forms on Earth. We use it, bacteria use it, trees use it, dogs use it, insects use it. Uh, it, it is universal. And one of the interesting upshots of that is we now have the technology to move genes between species. And so they have taken human genes and placed them inside bacteria. And the bacteria is able to make that human protein, which we can now use for pharmaceutical drugs. They can purify the protein that the bacteria make and, and make it into a prescription, uh, prescription drug. And here's another example of that. They put some human genes inside this goat. Um, and when they milk the goat, the, uh, that's where they collect the proteins from. And again, they have to purify the proteins from the other proteins in the milk. But you know, it, it's a way to manufacture proteins that can be used in, as, as human medicines. And this one, I think, is a really neat one. This is where they took a gene for a a glowing protein in fireflies. It's called the luciferase gene. And they put it inside a plant, and you get a glow of the arctic plant. How, how cool is that? Um, anyway, uh, so the, the gene, the, the recipe for each protein, is found, in the, is found in the nucleus. But of course, the ribosome is out there in the cytoplasm, and it needs to get those codons to know how to make the protein. And so the way this works is a temporary disposable copy of the gene, uh, of, of the strand of the gene that has the codons, is made. That's called a messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA exits the nucleus and goes out of the cytoplasm. And that's what the ribosome is going to use to, uh, for the codons to manufacture that particular protein. The, the process by which that messenger RNA is made from the gene is called transcription. And here's the basis of how it works. When an a, when a, when a organism is going to express a gene, which means make the mRNA and then have the RNA be translated into a, into a protein, the first step is that the uh, transcription is done. The two strands of the gene move a little bit apart from each other like this. And then there's this enzyme called RNA polymerase, which comes along. And RNA polymerase is going to attach onto um, one of the strands, um, this particular strand in this example right here, like a train going along a railroad track. And uh, I'm not sure if I introduced these terms the first time we went through this, but the strand that the RNA polymerase is going to run across is called the template strand. strand of the gene that is transcribed, that the RNA polymerase will, will run on and make a complementary mRNA to it, the template strand. And the other strand that the RNA polymerase is not attaching to is called the non-template strand. But notice that the non-template strand is the one, in a sense, that has the codon. ATG is the first codon, GDA and CCC is that stop codon. So it's a little counterintuitive. The RNA polymerase doesn't attach onto the one that has the codons. It attaches to the complementary strand to that one. That is the template strand down at the bottom. All right, so RNA polymerase attaches to the template strand, and it just runs along it, and it's going to make 
it's going to find the, the complementary RNA to each of those DNA nucleotides on the, on the template strand. Like that. So notice the RNA polymerase enzyme doesn't need to know the sequence of this ahead of time. It just sort of runs along the, the template strand, and whenever there's a T, it, it's an A. Whenever there's an A, it makes a U. Whenever there's a C, it makes a G, like that. It just is doing complementary base pairing. But notice what you get. You get something that has the same codons as the non-template strand. And so this is how we essentially have made a, a copy of the non-template strand. And it sort of makes sense because why are they the same sequence? Because they're both complementary to the, to the template strand. All right, so there's the messenger RNA. And it will detach itself from the, from the gene. And now it's going to exit the nucleus and go to the ribosome. And then reading those codons, the ribosome is going to then piece together the protein. First codon AOG is for methionine, that codon GAA is for uh, glutamate, next codon CCC is for proline, like so. The, uh, one, the, the one part of this picture that I haven't really dragged in yet are the transfer RNAs.